I begin the sermon with a song from the duo Ma Muse. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round attend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change and lie from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive, it is time to lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. Having spent the past couple of weeks asking nearly every group about how individuals and the congregation are handling all these transitions in ministry, it seems fair that I would offer a minister's perspective. Now, these past couple of weeks have been as important for me in some ways as for you, because I am in my own transition. I am letting go of my previous ministry in Geneva and moving closer to Peoria. And I can tell I am mid-shift uh, because my pronouns are a mess. I can't tell when I should say you, or when I should say this congregation, or we, or us. And all doing that all before today's vote. We're not even in the same physical space. There is a cognitive dissonance in using Geneva's chalice while preaching for Peoria. But here's the image that came to me as I was driving around Sunday afternoon after hosting the Zoom coffee hour in the sanctuary. So I feel like, I feel like um, a heart, a, a person-sized heart, if you will, that is poised between two ocean liners going in different directions. Now one ship is headed this way and the other is headed that. And there I am in the process of letting go from one while preparing to leap fully into the other. Now, the change was always in the plan, mind you. Uh, the interim minister leaves the congregation and embraces the next ministry. And doing so requires navigating so many moving parts and multiples of everything happening at the same time. So here we are, on the brink of an enormous leap of faith and a major undertaking to figure out what ministry together might mean for the present and for tomorrow. We are working from the momentum of those who came before in this congregation's 177, as of Tuesday, year history along with those who are here now. For the next chapter in this community's life, you are preparing to receive new companions and new perspectives. Every time somebody enters the congregation, something is a little bit different. And we do all of this amid the context of shifting roles of the role of institutional religion in individual and social life. We are in the middle of profound alterations in how church is understood. And we're also figuring out what it means to be the church when we're not in the building. We get to articulate and live into its larger mission and purpose. We get to figure out what it is to be a liberal religion, uh, this servant church, this pilgrim church, and embrace this adventure of the Spirit. Now, I will offer that our starting point for navigating all the moving parts 
is our theological resilience. 20th century Unitarian Universalist theologian James Luther Adams tells us that in liberal religion, revelation is continuous. We are open to new truth and are open to finding truth in a multitude of sources and forms. We are witnesses to how faith and belief and ritual, along with nature and the cosmos, as well as human actions, all show up in life and in history. And through the lenses of thought, intuition, experience, tradition, education, we determine how to place ourselves in relationship with the world, even as we keep wondering and building and revising and refreshing. So what we learn and what we cherish also has to include a direct application. So our theological openness must have real life impact if it's to have gravity and meaning. Adams reminds us that there is no immaculate conception of virtue. I'll say it again. There is no immaculate conception of virtue. If you preach it, you have to live it. And so let me offer for a moment why I talk about him. I've made a couple of those points before, but this is really why I talk about Adams in particular. I'll go deeper into them, but for now, let me offer that Adams he visited Europe uh, in the 1930s and witnessed the failure of the church to declare a moral center and resist the rise of the Nazis. The church did not use its power to act against the growing force of destruction. Plain and simple. Adams came away from that moment determined to figure out what the liberal church can do and to claim its authority and power in the moment and named its possibility and its responsibility in liberal religion. The liberal church in every age must respond to the systems of oppression if those values are to be relevant and to indeed have impact in the world, to nurture what we plant and what we hope for. As Quaker guide Parker Palmer tells us, let your life speak. We can debate theology and theory and politics and books and everything and so much more. And then what do we do about it? Christian religious educator Maria Harris tells us that the congregation is the curriculum. We are our own lessons in the day-to-day -day and ongoing conduct of congregational life. How we engage, what we avoid, how we say yes or no are all information for visitors and members and friends and for our children. How we interact with each other, who we include, and how we declare limits around behavior are all expressions of what we preach. In the examined faith, we are thoughtful and intentional as much as possible, as long as long, also while being joyful and honest and compassionate. So in case it wasn't clear, I have some high expectations. Both of you and of me and what has been wonderful to experience in the past couple of weeks is that you do too. I expect a liberal church to show up, not in a one-time only kind of uh, way or not in a way that uh, I expect the congregation, any single congregation to save the world as it were, but there is so much ahead of us right in front of us, in fact, with all the projects and the concerns of this congregation and of the city. I take a cue from Stan Lee and Spider-Man that with great power comes great responsibility. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a unique obligation to participate in the way that a religious community can and does, and still, and now more than ever, needs to do so. 
the form of how to do church is really fluid at this time. It's going to be hard to know exactly how to predict what we will be like in 10, 20 years. But we also get to do this work together and have a larger perspective of what we are apart. It is sacred work that we do, something that is set aside because doing this is a special application and a particular way to care for the world and all of our ages and all of our children. Beyond the congregation, or even a particular faith, we are part of something that is so much greater than ourselves. And the work has already been with us in these past couple of weeks. Uh, for me, even meeting by Zoom, uh, the meetings and the conversations have been really beautiful. Together we are solving problems along with revealing hopes and dreams, I get to listen to stories about what this congregation means to you and the joy and great spirit of being with this body and with these people. Now, before I go any further, let me not uh, downplay the challenges as well. Creating religious community in the best of times is messy and awkward and perpetually unfinished and terribly unresolved. You and I both will be uncomfortable and ticked off and frustrated and even at times wonder if all this is worth the trouble. Seriously, I, I will make mistakes and I will disappoint you. And I will feel the same about you. We will need a lot of forgiveness and a lot of grace and offering that to each other as often as possible. I'll tell you that the goal that we have in committing to new ministry together is not, is not to be perfect or to make each other happy. This is something we talk about with couples who want to marry, that happiness One's own happiness is not your partner's job. It's never your partner's job. They are not there to make you happy and you're not there to make them happy either. Those are not the promises you are making. The promise that comes from entering into a sacred relationship is that of more abundance, of a more abundant life together. To be in that kind of commitment amplifies the experience of everything we do. And this applies to church and ministry as well. We do this ministry together because we cannot do it alone. And, and the promises are still not to make each other happy, but to be more joyful, to live into hope and possibility. Our effort yields a far greater result than anything we could accomplish alone or even as a family or even as a group of friends. Reverend Mark Morrison Reed reminds us that our perspective becomes wider in the religious community and we come, become more open to, to new truth and new revelation as well. We are part of a love that will not let us go and we commit to remaining in that promise and in that relationship for as long as we are able. Now, the forms of this ministry, because we have to have direct application, right? The forms this ministry takes, the forms this abundant life shows up as, there's so much that's already here, so much that has been passed down along the ages and the years to this moment. There is already worship. There is already small groups working together. I'll tell you what I shared with the facilitators the other day. Um, the way I learned, first learned about small group ministry was the phrase, saving the world 10 people at a time. You wonder where I get my high expectations. No small expectations there. But 10 people at a time, a little here and a little there, that 
feels manageable. That feels like we could actually make a difference. But we also get to do this in connecting with other congregations in this ministry, in our social witness, in naming oppression, in calling the truth as we see it. We are learning from the curriculum of our lives across the country. We remain committed to investing in preparing a place for those who find this place in the next generation. All of this we do together in that balancing between going from one place to the next. So much is before us. This next ministry begins with willing to commit to a new future and to lead with love. We shall indeed be known by the company we keep. May we begin by keeping this company with each other. Amen.